ready to go on, Pierre? Uh, so I'd like to introduce Warren Koch. Warren, are you here? Uh, there yeah. he is. Great. Um, he is going to present the Army device, which is just fascinating. I'm not going to tell the story because I assume he's going to tell the story, but there's a really <laughs> fascinating story behind this. Uh, um, now, as you know, I'm all about collaboration, not trying to set up a cage match here, but I believe Dr. Schultz is a little skeptical of the Army device. Uh, the purpose of this conference is not to resolve that issue right now. Um, but I do think it is important to point out that um, there are a lot of things that we don't know and people may disagree about uh, ways things could work. And I certainly think we can ask some questions about that. So take it away, Warren. Sounds good. And I'd like to, I can give Eric a, a personal tour through the whole thing at some point here. Would love to debate him, but probably not enough time in this five minutes. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for having me here again, by the way. It's, um, I've been with this project since March 17th, and it's been a, a real long ride. So thanks for all the hard work and still going, everybody here. Uh, so yeah, so if everyone can see this, um, yeah, that basically this picture is all I have to share for this presentation uh, with this short amount of time. But it's all that you really need, because uh, that's all this device is. What you're seeing is the entire device. Uh, it's just this simple. It's a, about as simple as you can expect any ventilator to really get. Uh, air comes in the bottom at a low flow rate, um, which is then turned into a high pressure flow, which flows to the patient on the right side, uh, where it fills up the patient's lungs up to a specified pressure that is set by the geometry of the device. Once that pressure is released, it goes down to the V um, airfoil, basically, essentially, uh, where it will then um, go exhale out the exhalation port, and uh, then the pressure in the lungs decreases down to a set pressure, at which point the process will repeat itself and the air will flow back to the patient lungs. Uh, so yeah, we basically have the ability to uh, manufacture these devices at a massive uh, pace. We're basically the fastest ventilator I think that anybody's ever gonna be able to make here. Uh, it can easily scale to a thousands produced uh, a day. It comes with a variety of manufacturing methods, materials, and low lead time options available, so we could start immediately if we had to. Uh, basically, the whole intent of this device uh, back in March was to just be a panic button solution, so, so that if we just needed it, and we really thought at that time that we might just need it within weeks even, uh, this device could scale up to millions if we need it. Uh, so, now that the world has bought us a longer timeline with uh, the responsible flattening of the curve in most places in the world, at least, um, we're, we're kind of trying to figure out what our place will be in the ecosystem of ventilators in, in the coming months here. Uh, perhaps this isn't needed anymore. Perhaps it's not as advanced as other ventilators. But we do think that this actually does pretty well. At, at it, it gets you pretty far along the lines here. And, I'm really up to debate to see just how far it can go um, and what other solutions we can like cobble together to to fix anything that it's it's not able to do, but we'll see. Um, so about this device, it has no moving parts. Uh, the device geometry can be tuned to any minimum and maximum pressures, inhalation and exhalation ratio and target respiration rate. Basically any range here, you just uh, can bake it into one of these devices and it will be set by the geometry subject to uh, changing patient lung capacity resistance and compliance. So as the patient's lungs change, you can expect the respiration rate and tidal volume to uh, adjust with that because this is a pressure-based um, ventilator. Uh, so it also has an assisted function where as the, if the patient instigates a breath and tries to suction, uh, it will assist with the patient and actually help them to breathe. Uh, if you're doing this at a slow enough rate, then you can basically have this just be an assisted uh, entirely assistant, uh, um, yeah, uh, assistant uh, ventilator here so that they can just um, breathe in and out uh, on their own pace and this will just pick them up if they fail to breathe at the at a fast enough rate uh, if they're going too slow. Um, so yeah, and then the device can operate off of, oops, I have no idea why that just closed. One sec. Here we go. Um, it can offer, operate off of any high flow input stream and only low pre air pressures are needed. 
to run it. So even an air mattress fan motor could probably run this, uh, but we wouldn't recommend that for a long period of time. Uh, so we foresee this as a modular component to other devices or as a first line of defense improvement over just bagging patients. Uh, it can attach directly to an intubation tube or an airtight uh, mask for non-invasive solutions, uh, as long as it's closely attended. Uh, but we recommend that on the patient circuit, you at least attach a pressure release valve and a ideally a capnography carbon dioxide sensor um, hooked to alarms for unattended patients is the kind of maybe our, our, our idea of what the minimal sensors might be for this to still uh, leave, a, leave patients relatively unattended. Uh, so as simple as this device appears from the feedback of medical testers, it appears to still provide uh, sufficient care in a disaster scenario, maintaining patient breathing within target parameters. And we have some nice, um, nice graphs that I'm not sure how legally I'm allowed to show uh, at the moment here due to some, uh, some difficulties within our teams. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we have some some graphs that are pretty close to what you would see from professional ventilators. So this thing can surprisingly actually have, um, yeah, can produce some some nice uh, pressure curves still. Um, so, but instead of, uh, so most ventilators you'll see would have adjustable dials um, or something to, some way to change all of these parameters on the fly. This one doesn't do that. It's just a static device that can be built to order. And instead, if a doctor wants to switch these uh, to give something else to their patient and um, and adjust their 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 uh, prescription here for the patient then they would just need to switch it with another device uh, so we are planning to offer this with multiple sizes each one tuned to different uh, minimum and maximum pressures as well as as IE ratio and uh, respiration rate and tidal volume even. Um, so the device is currently in testing again and looking for additional regional sponsors and manufacturers. Uh, the designs are all available open source, uh, though we're still catching up to see, due to some, uh, some team issues here. And we are based off of a 60 year old fluidic device uh, patent, which originally tested successfully on dogs as well as humans. Uh, it was made by the US Army back in the day. And there are others, uh, similar patents around those days um, within the same 10 year period that have all kind of gone out of use. So there's an interesting story there as, as Robert said. Um, we're looking for anyone interested in assisting with this project, especially anyone interested in sponsoring a version of the device or assisting with their country's local regulatory approval process or integrating this device into their own designs, which maybe somebody would be interested in that. That's kind of takes a whole section and just turns it into a nice static device. Uh, so please contact us at, at armyvent at gmail.com or the website or find us at the helpful engineering Slack at uh, Project Oscillating Ventilator if you, have, if you want to help. And thank you again. And I can take any questions here. Thanks, right. thank you, Reverend. I'll, I'll start again with a question regarding Risk management. So you you mention your minimum recommended sensors that you were considering. Did did you came did you come to this conclusion based on the formal risk management process? Or? Uh, no, we definitely have to do some more formal uh, processes to get that set. But our our best guess uh, from a lot of just rough estimates is that all we will really need to sense is the respiration rate. Uh, which the CPAP can get us and is, and also gets us the bonus carbon dioxide rate um, in the air. Uh, but if we have respiration rate, then we can set an alarm for minimum and maximum respiration rates exceeded, or well, actually more, more accurately, it would be um, in, inspiratory and expiratory times. Uh, if we sense that uh, breaths are taking too long or too short, then either way it should set off an alarm and that could indicate any of a leak or a fault in the wiring, or, or sorry, not the wiring, the, yeah, fault in the tubing um, or a uh, blockage in the patient's lungs or a sudden adjustment in the patient's uh, lung compliance, any of which would be something that we'd want a medical expert to come and attend to. So it's, it's a guess still, and there's still a lot of work to be done in those areas.
So I've heard um, a couple of uh, other groups say that they've had um, issues with like peak inspiratory flow rates with some of their devices. Is that something where like sort of the, the dramatic flow change when like a patient would start to take a breath or something like that? Um, is there, you know, I guess I'm just kind of curious with your device, like how that works and, and if you've tested or looked into that piece of things. Uh, so peak inspiratory flow, I guess we don't really have a separate, I mean, again, this thing, this device won't be using the sensors. We've just been using Ventmons and some other devices to apply the kind of sensor side of it. Um, but yeah, uh, as long as there's a pressure release valve, then we won't be exceeding any of the uh, dangerous pressures. But as far as peak inspiratory flow, I, I guess that's interesting. Uh, we don't have anything to stop that from happening or to to protect against that. Um, and we, yeah, it, we would recommend some sensor to to look at that. But yeah, I'm not sure what to say for peak inspiratory flow issues. Uh, yep, Eric. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think yeah. Well done for getting this far. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't have spoken, but Robert dropped me in a little bit. I just, uh, so, so my concerns, you know, with, with this device, um, yeah, other than it being used as a, a test device and something that you can use to test instrumentations and things, which I think it might have a role in, um, is basically the oxygen consumption. It's a wonderful, yeah, really attractive um, portable design, but my concern is that you'd end up lugging a, a, a bunch of oxygen around or consuming a lot of oxygen, which negates that one benefit. But probably even greater than that is just my concern about how you'd go about adjusting all these settings in the face of a, a patient with altering um, respiratory compliance. And um, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, patients don't stay the same. They're all very different. Um, and then and then they then they change, you know. You, you get them, you've got them set up, and then they get either better or worse. Um, and so, I mean, they're my concern. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I guess I'm thinking the design's been around for 60 years, and I'm I'm pretty sure there's a reason why it hasn't taken off. You know, to be honest with you. Um, but I, I mean, I guess like I think I indicated to you on Slack, I'd be happy to. Yeah, if you want to post one to me, I can. I'm I'm going to hunt around at work and see if I can find some registrars who'd um, who'd like to test it, and we could use it with uh, Robert Spentmon and, and and run the numbers and actually calibrate the oxygen consumption with it. But um, I guess it's, this is and just to be really clear, this is one of about three major streams of activity that I would really um, hope that people will reevaluate the merit of. Um, and you know, and and perhaps take what they've learned in the pathway that they're on, and then put that back into the collective pot of wisdom that we all now have, so that we can, um, you know, keep moving with the with, with the best ways forward. But I mean, I I mean, I think it was great that you did it, great that you pushed it, and it was definitely I can understand completely the logic of of why this particular um, device was pursued, and um, you know. I, I'd be I'd be curious to play with one, but I guess I, yeah, they're my concerns anyway. Just since Robert, fair enough. Um, I mean, as I said, this is um, this is me, also uh, kind of a presentation me, to just of, offer this. In the interest uh, of time, let me give this back to Pierre and see if he wants to uh, uh, continue with this or ask another question. All right, Pierre. Oh, I, I see. I think we're ready for the next work for the for matter of uh, fairness between the teams and maybe Robert, Eric, and I or other can continue on other channels. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate Smith 